Uh, earlier in the week, earlier in the week, I had um, text Andrew and Ron. That you guys probably, some of you may not even know why. Why in the world would he text Ron? Well, um, every one of our deacons are assigned a ministry. They're the point person to deal with issues in that ministry. To just make sure and see what's going on and everything like that. And so usually when I, there are times when I just text Andrew because I forget to text Ron, but um, then, but most of the time I try to include them both. And earlier this week, I text Andrew and Ron and said, I think I need to preach first. And um, that's not all that unusual here where I'll preach before we'll sing or do anything like that. That's usually the norm when we have the Lord's Supper. I'll usually um, preach first. And, um, and, and so I, I told him that that's what I was going to do. And then um, this morning when I got up, I was just torn. I could not tell whether that was flesh or spirit. And so this morning I told them that, um, guys, go ahead, and I'll preach now. Um. Well, we're about to find out whether I should have preached first. What's going on in heaven right now? What's it tell us that, what are the angels and the four beasts and the 24 elders doing right now in heaven? The uncontrollable, nonstop, 24 hours worship. 
they're laying on their, they're bowing, they're on their faces, they're removing their crowns, they're all declaring, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, it's nonstop worship. Worship is far more than just coming to church. Worship is far more than having some people lead us in some worship songs. Worship is far more than you just standing out there or sitting out there. Worship is far more than you standing or sitting out there just singing the songs that are before you. You need to hear me. I have no intention of going back to where we were before that first week in February. I have no intention to just play church. I have no intention of us coming in here and just going through the motions and leaving the same way we came. I don't want that. I know God doesn't want that. Psalm 63, verses 1 through 7, and then over in 2 Samuel. I think I entitled, Welcome the Presence of God. Uh, um, titles aren't important anymore. I've definitely realized that. I probably realized that a long, long time ago. But I guess embracing God the one who has already embraced you um, I've spent all week just about twice a day uh, at the ICU with Danielle Painter, mainly because the rest of the family had COVID, and so just Jennifer and I were the only ones that were allowed in. And so um, I didn't want her to be alone. We all knew that she was dying, and so uh, I would go twice a day. As Stevie got better, Stevie was able to come, and, and so Stevie, the last couple days, just he just stayed. Yesterday, after she passed, um, Trish and I were home when, when we got the news, and so we drove to, to um, Danielle's house because that's where they all were. They were at her home. And so we walked in, and, and uh, Jennifer and Stevie come forward and get a hug. Well, I hug the way I normally hug, from the distance, from the side. Jennifer said, basically said, is that the best you got? And Trish made the statement. She said, well, you ought to see the way our daughter hugs. Our daughter has always, I mean, she doesn't like to be embraced. And so it's, when she hugs you, it's more of a pat. And there's a, there's a distance between, that's just the way she does. And so I hug from the side. Every now and then when someone's up here, I'll just cover them up. But that's not the way I usually hug. And let me tell you something. Since February, early February, God hasn't been doing this. It has been a swallowing, almost like I'm, I'm just in the, and I can smell him. Psalm 63, verses 1 through 7. Let's read the scripture. This is a Psalm of David. Interesting. Psalm of David. Oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I 
So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. I've looked for you in the place of worship. See your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth, my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, in other words, when I'm, when I'm laying down and going to sleep, when I when I'm, remember you, I will meditate on you in the night watches. I don't know what you understand just what has happened from verse 6 to where we are. Verse 1, early, in other words, from the time I wake up and all through the night, in other words, I'm going to fill my whole life just thinking about you and worshiping you. Why? Because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, under your embrace, with your arms coming around me, in the shadow underneath your wings, I will rejoice. Second Samuel, chapter six, um, six, verses one through fifteen. Who wrote Psalm sixty-one, sixty-three? This is David. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from, from Bale, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God. On a new cart. How was the ark of God supposed to be carried around? Anybody know? By, yeah, you got it. What is it? By golden poles, right? By golden poles and carried by the high priests, by the special priests, and it was supposed to be marched before the people of Israel. No new carts. You and I do not get to decide how God is to be respected. We're to respect and honor God in the way that he tells us to. You and I don't get to change that. He brought it out of the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill, which is, a, by the way, that if you, uh, this phrase, on the hill, it comes out in this scripture every time you hear about Abinadad, it's on the hill, it's on the hill, it's on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahil, the sons of Abinadad, drove the new cart. They brought it out of the house of Abinadad, which was what? On the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahil went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel, they played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on cisterns, and on, on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah, one of the sons of Abinadad, where the ark had been, he put out his hand. To the ark of God, he took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And if there wasn't a verse 7, you and I would have thought that what he did was a good thing. I mean, on the cart, the ox trips, the ark begins to wobble, he reaches his hand out just to, just to take care of the ark, to make sure that the ark doesn't move. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. And God struck him there for his error. Some of your translations won't have error there. 
in my, my Bible, which is the King James translation, it even puts it over the side and says, error. <laughs> it's like a big question. Error. His error. His irreverence. His, he, he thought God needed help. He thought God needed his help. How dare he think that God needed his help? Yeah, that's an error. Deeply rooted in a misunderstanding of who God is. I'm just going to help God here. God doesn't need your or my help. The realization is, is that's what Jesus meant, by the way. If, if the children of men don't worship him, guess what's going to happen? The rocks will. God doesn't need our help when it comes to worship. He's got a heavenly host that knows how to worship him. He's got the not only the multitude of angels and the four demons, I mean the four cre uh, creatures and the 24 elders. He's got all of that, but he's got all of creation. No, that's a good thing he's got everything else. Otherwise, he would get what we, what we just gave him. You understand that? Won't even rise in his presence. Think that we can we get tired, we'll just sit. Won't even sing. Thinking he doesn't need our voice. Won't even seek him in prayer. No, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that God has an army. know how to worship do you really want to go back honestly do you really want to go back to pre-february no jeff right and some of you don't even know because february and march went right past you and And David became angry <laughs> because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was not only angry, David was afraid. He was afraid of the Lord that day. So he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? It's not that the Scripture didn't, God didn't give instructions about how the ark could come, okay? You understand that? It's not like God failed to tell them how to bring the ark of God when they, whenever they wanted to bring it. It's not like God just said, well, you know what, I, I'm just going to leave that part out. So because of David's anger and his fear, David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, into Jerusalem. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom. I like that name. It sounds good when it comes out your mouth. Obed-Edom. You say it enough, it, it does sound good. I'm not going to name any of my, I don't want any of my great-grandkids named Obed-Edom. The Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittadite, for three months. So David just stops. He stops right there. They haven't done anything right. Oh, yeah, there was plenty of music and singing, but they haven't done anything right. So he just leaves it there. And look what happens. For three months... 
And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now, it was three months later, verse 12. Now, it was told King David, say, hey, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belonged to him because of the ark of God. So, now David says, okay, well, I don't want them just to have the blessing. I, I want it in all of Israel. I want to bring it to Jerusalem. So he went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. You're going to notice he still hasn't learned a whole lot. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. I think that's because he is afraid. So every six steps from Obed-Edom to Jerusalem, an ox and a sheep are sacrificed. That's a lot of ox, and that's a lot of sheep. Then David danced. He danced before the Lord. He wasn't a Baptist. Then David danced before the Lord with all. And the only reason I say that is because if you've ever seen me dance, you know there's no dancing moves in me at all. It's I'm lucky I can walk, much less dance. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with sound of trumpet. So let me catch you up on this 1 Samuel passage. At the beginning of 1 Samuel, God lets us know that the high priest and his two sons, who were also priests, were evil, were wicked. Now, Eli is not doing what Hophni and Phinehas is doing, but Hophni and Phinehas are two priests, Levites, children of Israel, that are doing abominations in, in the midst of worship and outside of worship. And there's no sense of repentance at all. What they're doing out there, they don't tremble. They come in. There's no fear and trembling with them at all. They're out there doing all kinds of abominations, all kinds of sins. They come in. They do the sacrifices to the Lord. They pray. They lead worship. But there is no trembling in them at all. And God has had it. God's had it so much that there's not, it's not about repentance anymore. You need to hear me. It's not about Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas repenting. God has had it so much that God raises up, literally has him born a child who will take the place of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, and his name is Samuel. So much so, Samuel is so big of a character that 1 Samuel and the chapter 2 Samuel we just looked at is named after him. Now, God, God is incredible, and you want to laugh because God takes this holy child, this birth, this chosen child, and God puts this child in the home under the same father who has raised these two sons who have no spirit of God in them at all. Samuel grows. God begins to speak to Samuel, but Samuel's never heard the voice of God. So he he says something to Eli, and Eli, it's been a long time since Eli's heard the voice of God, but he has heard it enough in the past that he knows what God sounds like. And he tells Samuel, that's God. That's pretty sad when you get to a place where all you can do is talk about what you used to have. Yeah, you can help people who still have it, but you don't have it anymore. And so he tells Samuel, go back, it's God, and God speaks. And God gives a prophecy in the midst of calling Samuel. God tells Samuel that Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas have outlived God's grace. That God is bringing death on all three of them. Eli asked Samuel, says, 
What did God tell you? Samuel doesn't want to tell Eli, but Eli already knows. Samuel finally tells him, and Eli says, yeah, there's no surprise. So in the midst, so that's happening, and then all of a sudden, God has raised up the Philistines, who, who they've been constantly fighting and having victory over and over and over again, victory. But God raises up the Philistines this time for his wrath and judgment on God's own people. And the Philistines come against them, and 4,000 of God's people are slaughtered because of Eli, Hopney, and Phineas. Well, Eli and Hopney and Phineas aren't dead yet. So Israel comes up with this idea. Let's take the Ark of the Covenant with us, and we'll go fight the enemy with the Ark of the Covenant in front of us. They make this statement. They make this statement in 1 Samuel chapter 4. It, it says, this is the reason they do it. You need to listen. It, not God, it, meaning the Ark of the Covenant, will save us from our enemies. It. It. You know what just happened? That's called idolatry. They made a thing that was holy and set apart for God and made it their God. And we can do the same. It can be a place. It can be a thing. That's set apart for God that all of a sudden we make it our God. So they take it. They take it. And Hopney and Phineas lead the way with the Ark of the Covenant into battle. And guess what happens? They're slaughtered. Hopney and Phoenix are killed. The soldiers are killed. And the Philistines, the enemy, capture the Ark of the Covenant. Now, how in the world does that happen? Uzzah, who is a priest, touches the Ark and he dies. How in the world can Gentiles, those who do not bow to God, touch it, grab it, and carry it and still live? So they take it in. And they march it into their temple, the temple of Dagon, their, pre, their God. And they set the Ark of the Covenant in a submissive position in front of their God. And they celebrate. We have defeated Israel and we have taken their God. The next morning, do you know what happens? Dagon is, when they walk into the temple, Dagon has fallen flat on his face right at the Ark of the Covenant. He's fallen flat down. The priests of Dagon tremble. They set him back up. They think, well, that may, that maybe that's just a coincidence. The next morning, they go back in, and Dagon is down again. But this time, his head is broken off, and his hands are broken off. And he lays down there with no head and no hands. And now, all of the Philistines and all five kingdoms of the Philistines, they're all now afraid that maybe the God of Israel is more powerful than their God. And you know what happens? It's one of the funniest scriptures. I think it's funny. If you were a Pearson, you would think this scripture is funny. It's about hemorrhoids. Nothing funny about hemorrhoids. But if you were a Pearson, you, you're very acquainted with hemorrhoids. And it says that in the five kingdoms of the Philistines, that God sends tumors or hemorrhoids, depending on which translation. And men are dying. The rest of the men are walking like this because they just can't walk or sit anymore. And it says now they're praying. Well, yeah, when you walk like this, you pray a lot, okay? So now they're praying. They don't want the Ark of the Covenant in their presence anymore. 
So what do they do? They make a new cart. They don't have Leviticus. They don't have what the Israelites had. They don't have any priest to carry it. So they make a new cart. And they take two milk cows who have brand new calves, who have never been yoked, and they yoke them to that cart with no one walking by them, and they send them loose. Because their plan is, if those cows go back to their calves, then it wasn't God. What happens? Those cows do not even listen to the bellowing of their calves, and they head for Israel. And when it comes into the land of the Israelites, they do something really, really stupid. They open the ark, which means they touch it, they open it, and they look into it. And the Bible says 50,070 I think it's interesting, it doesn't, it doesn't just say 50,000. It says 50,070. More than what God killed among the Philistines, God kills among the Israelites because they looked into the ark. They had no respect. They made a grave error. Well, it's taken, it's taken out of that city because they're scared to death of it. And it comes to Abinadad's house on the hill. And it is treated with respect. How long does it stay there? 20 years. <laughs> 20 years in all of Israel, the only worship that's being taken place is in the house of one man. And God raises a desire in David. He wants all of Israel to worship God. But you understand. He thinks that the Philistines, the Gentiles, must know more about carrying the ark of God than God. So he does the same thing they did. He makes a new car. Philistines don't know any better. There is so much here, so much in this scripture. Um, I want to, and so I, I want to talk, because all this is, ba basically, I only have one message I want to tell you, is how are we going to worship? And I don't know whether I was supposed to preach first or not. I felt it earlier, but this morning I couldn't, dec couldn't decide. But I do know that the way we come in here to worship will determine whether we worship We have to learn from David and Israel's mistakes. First of all, God is not a thing. He's not confined between the cherubim. Did you notice that what David said? I mean, 20 years earlier, they're saying, it will save us. But David says, God lives between the cherubim. No. No. This is all God. God is not a thing, and he is not confined to one area or one place. God goes with you when you leave here, and he comes with you when you come. And he is worthy of praise all the time. You can't just catch up on Sunday morning. God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help in our salvation. 
He is more than enough to save you. He doesn't need your help. You don't steady God. He steadies you. He doesn't need your help. He just wants your submission. We are a people that do not know how to be still so we can know God. That whole passage rubs us wrong. But I'm telling you, when you come to the place where you realize that God doesn't need your help, all he wants is your submission, you will know God. And all your business and running around trying to make it happen will actually work against what God wants. The third thing that we can learn from, there is no room in a place of worship for anger. Anger leads to bitterness, which leads to unforgiveness. There is no place for anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, revengeful spirit, self-focused spirit in the presence of, of God. David knew that enough that he had to go away for three months. But there's also no room in worship for the kind of fear that David has. Now, you hear me carefully. Fear in the presence of God, especially in looking at the Scripture, it's a good thing. But the fear that causes you to be paralyzed and to stop seeking him is always a bad thing. Healthy fear causes you to know that God doesn't need your help. A healthy fear of God causes you to tremble. Long before you ever get in here. I thought it was interesting. I, I made two lists. I stay up here, I'll finish. I made two lists. A list of what God looks for in worship from me, from 2 Samuel, and one from um, Psalm 63, both about David, and they're pretty much the same. I, let me use... Psalm 63. First of all, I've got to want him. David wanted the presence of God with him in Israel. I've got to want it. That's why I started. I don't want to go back. In Psalm 63, he talks about it being a thirst. A longing, he says in verse 1. I thirst, I long. I've got to want the presence of God. I can't just come in here. I've got to seek it. Because I want it, I've got to seek him. Oh God, you are my God. Early, early I will seek you. If I want it, if I thirst for it, if I long, I'm going to still get up early. I'm going to lay before him and pray with him. Before I put up the cross, I don't remember what day it was, I got down here in my holy place. And I, I prayed, Lord God, don't let us go back. You create a hunger and thirst in us and every single one of us, that we wake up every morning asking for your fresh bread, that we will not even think about living on our spiritual bread you gave us last week or the week before, that we would start every day hungry. You know the Lord's Prayer. 
He's not talking about the stuff on your table. He wants you to get up every day hungry. Manna from heaven every day. And the thing different about us in Israel, we can get it seven days. When was the last time you prayed that part of the Lord's Prayer? Lord God, I don't want yesterday. I, I can't live on yesterday's bread. I, I want it today. Can you even remember the last time you asked that? But you got to want it. And then you'll seek it. And when you want it, and when you seek it, you'll find that it's not the it. It's not the it. It's not the longing. It's not the thirsty. It's not the being satisfied. It's him. I want him. Fresh every day in your life. So you want it. You seek it, and then you expect it. Look what he says in, in verse 2. So I looked for you in the sanctuary. I came to see your power and your glory. In other words, when he came into the place of worship, he expected and anticipated for God to feed him and to show up. He, he just can't come. You can't get up here and just do it. I can't do it. I got to expect it. I got to come in here into his place looking, expecting to see. I got to praise him. Verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Not might, they shall, they will. I will praise you. My mouth will sing praises. Not because of some words up here, not because I feel like it, but because who you are and you are worthy. When I don't feel like anything, when I don't want to do it, I'm still going to get up and praise you. This week, um, Bryson, I don't even know, you know this about your father. He, I know that they're serving today, but, and I would say this in front of your dad. And I don't even remember when it was. It was a few weeks ago, and your dad is the reason that I told Trish, okay, you need to put some praise song on my phone. I, I need to be listening to it. It was a Thursday and uh, I was with Bryant, and Bryant was asked to pray. And Bryant said, I don't know whether I can do that. And I thought, what? He said, on Thursdays, I only praise. On Thursday, I don't ask for anything. I just give him thanks and praise for all that he's already done. And if you want me to pray and ask him to do something here, I'm not going to be able to do that because I have a covenant with God that on Thursday I will praise him. Well, Chris puts Moody Bible Institute on my phone, and I've been listening to praise songs, and I hit, went to one of the sermons, and you know what? This guy over in England, he's preaching, and he says, on Tuesday, not Thursday, on Tuesdays, for as long as I can remember, I don't ask God for anything. I give him praise. Now, I recognize that if I call any day, and I'll be honest with you, I pick Thursday. But I recognize, and God and I, we've had a talk. I said, God, there's going to be people because of what you called me to do that's going to come to me and they're going to ask me to pray for them. And God said, you go ahead. When I send somebody to you, you go ahead and pray for them. If I don't send anybody to you, you better only be praise. Do you know how hard that is? 
devote one day just to praise. But you know what happened? I realized I can't do it very long. I can't even make it an hour. God said that's because there's not enough praise going in you. I put this little thing in my ear, and I listen. Now I listen every day because I know that what goes in will come out. You will not devote your lips to praising him unless you come before him and recognize how almighty and how good he is. You need to fill your life with some praise. And don't wait until you get in here to have it happen. One of the things I realized real quick when I was leading prayer conferences was that Baptists Baptists don't know the difference between thanksgiving and praise. If I ask a Baptist to give me praise, they're going to do thanksgiving because they don't know how to praise. And they think thanksgiving is the same thing as praise. So after 13 years of doing it, I finally got to the place where I just didn't ask Baptists. If I were to ask you right now, give them praise, it would be thanks. Thanksgiving in Scripture is always related to a bounty that you have gotten, something that you know you have received from God, and you say, thank you. But praise comes from the overflow of who God is and not because of what you've gotten. And we don't know how to do that because though we really don't understand how big God is, so when we get ready for praise, we almost always go to Thanksgiving. So much so we can't even eat a meal without making sure we do Thanksgiving. We're terrible at praise. But I'm telling you, We're going to have a hard problem in worship. We don't become a people that live to give him praise. Because all we're going to do is just give him thanks when he really moves. When we really, really say, oh, it's got to be big. Because most of the time, we just miss it. It's going to have to be really, really big. And oh, then we'll give them thanks then. Give them praise. Like the angels, 24 elders, and the four creatures. That's because of who he is. Because of who he is. Andrew, you and your team, come on up. I'm almost done. I put this as fifth, but I really don't know whether it's fifth or third. It comes out also in verse 3. Let me read it. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. We have to come to a place where we live in appreciation. In this case, for his loving kindness. We have to come to a place where we live in appreciation because of who he is and how he relates to us. I know I'm gray-headed, but I'm not alone in here. Some of you are white. How many of you ever had your, oh, I'm not going to hit you, just smacked to the side of the head by your mom or dad? More times than you can, I'm just, 
because you didn't say thank you. I'm telling you something. When you're little, because it's not in the human nature to say thank you. And, every, and other people were doing stuff, and, and you're being bopped in the head. You know what happened? When you've got kids, you do what? Bop them in the head. <laughs> and it goes to the next kids and the grandkids, and it just keeps on going, bopping, bopping. You're being bopped in the head by someone who was bopped in the head, I'm telling you. That's just the way it happens. But it used to be a time when parents trained their kids to say thank you, to express appreciation. When you and I come in these doors, you and I need to know that it is not just our only time. It is one of our many times where you and I get to say thanks. Thanks comes easier when you appreciate who he is. And the last thing, which I think creates a circle more than just a linear line, I think it creates a circle. When you and I get to the place where embracing and welcoming his presence consumes us, it won't just be during our days. At night, we will lie there meditating, thinking about his goodness, his blessings, his who he is, and it will consume our mornings and our nights. When that happens, and we come in here, I am not a prophet. I've, and Lord, if you're making me one, then I apologize for that statement. What we've had happen over the last few months has been the work of the Holy Spirit. You hear me? But I believe we're about to enter into a new phase. Where the Holy Spirit sits. And he watches us. See if we have learned anything that he has taught us. But if we will, whether we're going to hunger and thirst for his sitting, come active. I'm telling you, I'm already hungry. For him to stop sitting. But will you? There are some sermons that should be preached before you do anything else. Sermons about praise and seeking and embracing Him should always be preached before you. Is there a hunger and a thirst in you? A longing as it fills your days and your nights? Do you know how to praise him or can you only give him thanks? 
never, never mistake. The music and the singing. For worship. They might be able to worship. Will you? See, you and I don't have to go out anywhere and bring the Ark of the Covenant back. God lives in us. We are the tabernacle. We are the temple. He lives in us. Not just when we come in that door, but all the time. He lives in us, and he is worthy of praise. May we never allow the rocks, the angels, or preachers, or the 24 elders do our worship for us. May we join them. They're not waiting for us, by the way. Just like I'm not going to wait for you. I think God longs for. See, I think God's thirsty. Father, may we approach you with a little bit of fear and trembling. May we always remember you don't need our help, but you do welcome us. May you fill us, Lord God, with worship. And may we overflow worship to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand. It's
this morning, but prayed this morning when we came in here, we always pray about 9 o'clock over the service and over different things, and that was part of our prayer this morning. Let this continue as we go out the door. doesn't stop. It starts. It never stops. The worship and the praise, all of it continues on. Let's see here. Jacob Thrasher, will you close us? <laughs> 